My name is Gary Henneke. I'm married to a woman called Ray Dean, and our home is Franklin, Tennessee. We have, we've been Tennesseans now for 27 years. They tell me that every seven years, your body totally replaces all the cells, and that you're flaking off and giving off and building, and your body's constantly building. And you're, so I am three times over now, pure Southern. And I've lived in the South that long, and I'm grateful to be with you. Okay, let's begin. In the word of the Lord, we're told in the life of Jesus that as he came down to the last year, the year preceding his crucifixion, he's on his way toward a destiny that according to Holy Scripture was set by God before he created the universe. The way the Bible usually reads it this way, before the foundation of the world. God purposed before anything existed that he was going to be a God in covenant with you, that he was going to be a God in relationship with us, and he purposed to become that. And we read in the scriptures that Christ is slain from the very foundations of the world. In other words, the cross is not something that happened to Jesus. He comes on purpose. And the way your scriptures usually read in the traditional Bibles, they read this way, with his face set toward Jerusalem. And a date is drawing near. And in the last year of his life, approximately one year before According to John chapter 6, in the season of the Passover that preceded his crucifixion, he keeps trying to get away. He goes to the other side of the sea, and they all follow him. <laughs> I always see this picture of Jesus and the 12 apostles in a big boat with a sail. I never quite get the view that it was like more like Canada geese, <laughs> that where he went, other boats followed. And so I never picked it up that there's this flotilla of boats going across the lake. But John 6 proclaims that. We're told that he'd go up the mountains. One time he went away to a land called then Phoenicia. We today call it Lebanon. As far as Tyre and Sidon. And a woman with a broken daughter wouldn't leave him alone. No matter where he went, he could not get them alone. And so in the middle of his life, he leaves his base at Capernaum never to return, now on his way toward the cross. And he needs to prepare these men for what is about to happen and what is before them. And so the Bible says he took them north, 23 miles, where the land of basalt against the lake called Galilee that makes the town called Capernaum gives way, across the Hula Valley of the ancient tribal land of the tribe of Dan, away from Zebulun and Naphtali. He goes north toward Mount Hermon, which today is on the border of Syria and Israel. And there in the land of the Gentiles, he will, on Galilee of the Gentiles, ask a question. In the weeks ahead, we'll look at Mark and we'll look at Matthew and see what they say about it. But if you'd like to read with me and want to see it in your favorite Bible or if you access your Bible electronically and you want to read along with me, I'm going to begin reading now in Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, we're going to begin reading at verse 18. And this is the way my Bible reads. And I'll have it up here, and you can see it on the screen if you don't have scriptures with you. And what I'll do is I'm going to read uh, verse uh, 18 down through 27, and I'll just read the scripture and not make any comment, and then I'll go back to verse 18, and we'll unfold it, okay? Luke 9, 18 reads like this. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, his disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets of old has risen. And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, 
the Christ of God. And then it goes on to read this way, but he charged them and he commanded them, tell no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things. He'll be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. He'll be killed and on the third day be raised. And then he said to them all, if any man would come after me, let's neutralize that, if any person would come after me, let that one, and my version here reads, deny himself. The ancient text actually reads, disown himself. You, you can't deny yourself. Everywhere you go, there you are. You know, it's impossible to deny yourself, but what he's trying to say, and what we do, that means, oh, I'm going to give up one meal a week. <laughs> he says, deny that you belong to yourself. Deny yourself. Take up his cross. Follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake, he will save it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of his Father and the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some of you standing here who will not taste death till you see the kingdom of God. There's a lot of stuff in there. And I'm sure they didn't get it all when they heard it. And I'm sure we don't get it all yet. <laughs> but we're going to look at it for a moment, and I'm going to begin with verse 18. And the way the Scripture's read, as I read it to you at the very beginning of that portion of Scripture, it said this, and it came to pass, or once, you know, I always thought that was how the Bible was written, and it happened. <laughs> that's actually English. That's how we translate it. But since King James, that's how the Bible talks. Once, and then it says this, he was praying alone, and his disciples were with him. Isn't that interesting? What an interesting thing. He was alone. They were with him. He was alone, but he wasn't alone. Hello? Have you ever been in a crowd and still been alone? You see, this whole text begins to say he was with them, but they weren't really with him. He was with them, but he was still alone. Now, before a preacher in the 21st century starts picking on the apostles. Let me just tell you, these guys had left their homes, left their businesses, left their families. They'd given up everything to follow him. So while I'm poking at them, let's remember who they were. And they were selected by him. They were his disciples. So we ask us, then what's that mean? He was praying alone, and they were with him. That's a significant moment to ask somebody, who do you say that I am? I've been a preacher in the Church of the Nazarene for over a half a century. I know I don't look it. <laughs> yeah, I've been around a while. And you know what? If I were going to ask for instance, a church board when I had one. <laughs> I'm sanctified holy now. I don't have a board. <clears throat> but if I were to ask you, if I were going to have a committee, if I was going into a meeting of people and I was going to say, who do, who do you say I am? I would set it up ahead of time. You've got to get the right answer. For instance, if I were Jesus and I were going to ask you, who do you say I am? I'd do it right after I walked on water. <laughs> How about that one? Wouldn't you? Or how about just after you call Lazarus out of the dead? That'd be a moment. Now who do you think I am, huh? You want to get the right answer. But he's in prayer. In prayer is when you look the most dependent 
the most in need. It's a moment of absolute powerlessness. And yet he's saying, while he's in prayer, who do you say that I am? I'll repeat it. I'd do it right after I took one little boy's lunch and fed thousands of people. That's when I'd do it. But you see, if he's not God in the moment of absolute weakness, he's not God at all. Anybody can be God when it's going well. And he's preparing them for what's ahead. And so he's alone. They're with him. And he turns to them. Now, he does it the way we do it, which is, let's have a survey. Who do the crowds, who do the people, who do the masses say that I am? <laughs> After the last two years in the United States, if there's anything we should never trust again, it's a poll. <laughs> Have you noticed the guys who got wiped out in the last election with the polls are the ones that are on TV every day still quoting the polls? Yeah, we're going to stick by those lies no matter what it is, but... You know, but who do people say? And you, do you know how the survey came in? Well, some say you're Elijah. You know who Elijah is? Read your Old Testament. He's the guy with all the power, calls down fire out of heaven, consumes 120 priests. He's the one who can run ahead of a chariot and outrun Ahab and all his horses. He's the one, uh, he can make it stop raining for seven years, and he pray, and it's going to rain in torrential downpour. <laughs> he may live around here. <laughs> yeah. You know what they're trying to say when you're Elijah? You're the powerful one. In America, we make an idol worship out of power. We do. If you're powerful, you can, you can be so inconsistent, people still think you're godly. That's how we run television. You know, when I was a boy, I grew up in the state of Iowa. And I don't blame me for that. That's where I was when my mom gave birth. And, and I grew up in Iowa. And the biggest thing that happened in an Iowa town every year at the Cedar Rapids Rail Station is this big thing came into town called Barnum and Bailey. I know Christians weren't supposed to go, but for a little boy, it was the biggest thing that ever came to town. It's the greatest thing. And out there, they had a tent. If you could get in it, everybody go in to see what this guy could do. And when he do it, they say, how's he do that? <laughs> we don't go to the circus anymore. We go to, we turn on Christian television. How do you do that? And if it's spectacular enough, we'll send money. <laughs> oh, yeah. I had a lady when I was pastoring Nashville First Church of Nazareth. She came to me one day and she said, I've been at this revival. And, and Dr. Enneke, it's the greatest thing I ever saw. I said, tell me about it. She said, the guy went like that and half the crowd fell down. I've, I've always wanted that power in board meeting. <laughs> you guys better laugh now because I may not be back next week when I get done with this. She said he blew his breath and they fell over. I've been near that breath. <laughs> and I said, you know, when Jesus did that stuff, it, would, it thrilled the crowd. He said, where's that at? Well, it isn't. Jesus never knocked anybody over. He's always getting them up. <laughs> but you know, you see, even if it's just the opposite of the Lord, if it's powerful, we'll send money. Who do you say I am? Elijah. Some say, and Matthew's going to say this, some say Jeremiah. Who's he? He's the weeping prophet. Sits by the streets. Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Jeremiah. And there are a lot of people who think Christ is the Christ of every crisis. Do you ever listen to our prayer requests? All it is is about Martha's warts and Joe's ingrown toenail. It's all health. It's all we care about. You know, when we run out of Medicare, we have prayer. It's been so long since I heard a real spiritual prayer request in a prayer meeting. All I just hear is pray for my cousin. She's going to have her eighth baby. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, 
Jeremiah, the Christ of everything, he's not only the Christ of the crisis, he's the Christ of the wedding feast. He's the Christ of everything. Some say you're John the Baptist. Who's John the Baptist? He's the big preacher. You know what it says in the scripture about John the Baptist? And all Jerusalem went out to hear him. I'm sure that's not literal, but it probably means all strata of Jerusalem. But all Jerusalem. You know, I pastored 18 years in Nashville, and all Nashville never came to hear me. <laughs> Within two blocks of my church was something called the Titans, and every Sunday they had a bigger crowd. <laughs> if big crowd meant you were really walking with God, then... <laughs> Eddie George was the most spiritual man in town. Who do you say that I am? That's a great question. And when they answer, you're the Christ of God. And we'll look at what Peter had to say after that. You notice Peter's always the one that... I'll tell you as a guy who spends a lot of time in a classroom now, in every classroom you have Simon Peter. There's always this student that answers every question no matter what you ask. <laughs> you <are. laughs> but we're not going to deal with that this morning. As soon as he's dealt with who do you say that I am, and they say the Christ of God. See, the Christ of God is not the answer. You say, duh. No, that's what he is. He's asked, who am I? They're giving the answer of what? He's the Mashiach of Israel, the Messiah of Israel. And they, they get a hold of that. But he's saying to them, who am I in your heart, in your life? And as we begin the march toward Easter, may I suggest to you, that's the only question that really matters? You know when you usually see that question now? Who is Jesus? On the magazine, sometime between now and Easter, it'll come up from either National Geographic or Life. They'll put it out. Or it'll be on your National Geographic channels as they try to explain some Bible book that didn't get accepted that tells us Jesus really wasn't who you think he was and try to talk at all. But, but you notice, it's a crazy question. What? Who do you say that I am? A man who lived 2,000 years ago. Why aren't they saying, who was he? But you see, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he still is. And the Christ who asked them, who do you say that I am, stands at the middle of my life, stands at the middle of your life, and says, okay, you're a good long-term member, you're a good faithful giver, you teach Sunday school, yip 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 and you lead worship. But who do you say that I am? Let me remind you, I began by saying they'd already left everything to follow him. But for the days that lie ahead, the anchor of life is settling the issue. Who is Jesus? Who is he to you? Who is he to me? And he's going to say to them after they get that behind them, if anyone wants to be my follower, if anybody wants to be my disciple, they must give up ownership to themselves. And then the word in most English Bibles is take up. It actually is bear the cross. Deny yourself in Greek, he is decisively settle it forever. Get yourself off your hands. Realize your life is a gift. You wouldn't be here but what for the grace and mercy of the Almighty God who gave you this existence and calls you beyond yourself. And he says, do you think your life belongs to you? It's been a gift given to you, so disown it. Realize somebody else. Your life is not your own. Disown yourself. Join me at the place of abject surrender, the cross. And then he says, and follow me. But in Greek, he actually says, and don't get ahead of me. 
In other words, stop doing it for God and start saying, if the Lord's not leading, we don't need to do it. And let God be God. The way we get in trouble is we walk without following. We're getting out ahead of Christ and then asking him to bless us when he's inviting us to join him. Well, you're going to have a potluck after I'm done. And if I keep going longer, you ain't going to like me much. And being as insecure as I am, I need to wrap up. I'm going to suggest to you in the weeks ahead that I think this question determines our depth. It doesn't matter if we're Nazarene, Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, or Episcopalian, or roll in the dust. The truth of the matter is, who Jesus Christ is can revolutionize your daily life. When I came to the Church of the Nazarene, we weren't smart enough yet to have all the programs we presently have. Church of the Nazarene's 110 years old, and I've been in, in it for over half its journey. I had been called to preach at the age of 16 in a whole other denomination that was liturgical, but I was involved in a Bible study, and the Bible study, they were teaching me, you have to be born again. I'd never heard of such a thing. Here I was preparing for the ministry and these people were talking about being born again. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was reincarnation. I had never heard of that. And they invited me to the Nazarene church and they said, you have to go morning and night. Well, we got over that one, didn't we? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but, but so I went in the morning and it was awful. In the second verse of the first song, a woman sitting in the second pew went, Woo! and I thought somebody just had a heart attack, and then she took off running down the aisle, ran past me and looked like a Comanche Indian. Two men right behind her, and all I could think of is, if you get me out of here, God, I'll never come back. <laughs> but I had given my word I'd come back at night. And at night, the preacher did two things. Number one, he took his text. And if anyone wants to follow me, let them deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. And then he began to preach. He stepped outside the pulpit to the next to it. In those days, you never stepped out of the pulpit. But when he stepped out of the pulpit, he began to cry. And I was sitting there and I thought, oh my God, he believes it. Now remember, I was preparing for the ministry. Well, I was the first guy at the altar, and before I got the altar, I was saved. Amen. See, I got saved my first Sunday in a Nazarene church. If I had grown up in that, I'd have learned how to resist it. But I hadn't, I hadn't been raised in it. I'd never been in anything like that in my life. And God talked to me. I got saved. The journey of a life began in the moment at an altar. Well, they put us in the Sunday school class. I was 20. My wife was 19. We were in our first six months of marriage. We were brand new in the middle of the Vietnam War. You got married, so you didn't go to war. Anyhow, I, I was, it, it, it was brand new, and everything, the world was all upside down. Now, see, the Nazarene church wasn't cool yet. We didn't know. The youth department hadn't told us that old people couldn't communicate with young people. So they put me in a Sunday school class of young marrieds, and the teacher was a 72-year-old widow. Now, you don't think that means much, or just let me tell you something. Widows in Iowa in the 19, early 1960s, I'm talking 1963, widows in Iowa were widows. Not what we have today. We have Tootsies who've lost their husbands. In those days, a widow looked like a widow. She wore only one color. Black. Besides that, she was an Iowa Nazarene. Her hemline was about that far above her foot. All black, and she never taught or came to sanctuary without a hat. Net. No colored makeup. If there was makeup, it was white. 
the net used to go in her earlobes. And I used to sit there and say, that has to hurt. She always had a white hanky here. Now, they couldn't wear any jewelry. Nothing on your fingers. You didn't wear jewelry. Nothing in the ears, God forbid. Not if you're a child of God. <laughs> Nothing in the ears. Now, I'm talking about Iowa in the night. She was our Sunday school teacher. We were the young marrieds. <laughs> I could go on and on and on about her. She wore these shoes that looked like a house from Kansas should drop on her. <laughs> you have to be older to know what that means. You have to explain that. <laughs> Somewhere over a rainbow. <laughs> that class began with 12, 12 of us and in two years was running 120 because of this teacher by the name of Carrie Deason. We young marrieds didn't want to live like that. We didn't even want to look like that. But I'll tell you what, we'd go to the wall for Carrie. We loved her with all our heart. Why? Because she prayed for us. And Carrie had no life except Jesus. We felt so sorry for her. Boy, was she good for us. She'd pray for us, and God would talk to her. We'd been saved about 90 days, and Radine and I were having a fight. She was wrong. Radine and I were having a fight, and the air in our house had gotten so thick that I went out and sat on the front steps. So I didn't want to be in the house anymore with old Grouchy, and um, the mail, mail truck came by, so I walked down to the mailbox and got my mail, and as I'm going through the bills, here came an envelope. It set up in the corner. I hear it said, Rev, it, it didn't say Reverend, it said Mr. and Mrs. Gary Henneke, and up in the corner it said, C. Decent. I have a letter from my Sunday school teacher. So I popped it open and began to read it, and here's what it read. We have it to this day. It said, Dear Gary and Radine, when I was in prayer this week, the Lord told me when you get this letter, you'll need it. I don't know what's going on in your home, but something that's breaking the heart of God. And I want you to get it under the blood and get it behind you. And I know by Sunday morning we'll all be rejoicing together. Now what do you do when you're having a fight with your wife and you get a letter like that? I'll tell you what I did. I went in the kitchen and said, here, this is for you. <laughs> Carrie Deason. I could tell you stories. If I tell you one more, I promise I'll quit. I graduated from Olivet. Iowa used to be on the Olivet region. And I didn't get a call to a church. And then a church called me. Eastern Michigan. Port Huron. Across from Sarnia. You could see Canada. That was not God's will for my life. I, Billy Graham, move over. I'm on my way. I had a great career. You don't start on the Black River Valley in Port Huron, Michigan at the edge of the country. So when the board elected me, I said, nope. They had 28 people up there, and they'd started this church. They wanted me there. And then, oh, I fell apart. Stomach, the odor coming out my nose and mouth. My wife smelled, said I smelled like I was dying of some horrible disease. She said, maybe we should send you to the leper colony. <laughs> yeah, it was just bad stuff. Finally, Radine said, you need to lay out a fleece. Now, we don't do that anymore, but we used to fleece God a lot. And, and what we do is we, you lay out something, and if God wants you to do it, he has to answer prayer. And, but if you're going to do this, make it impossible. Because after all, God could come through, and you end up where you don't want to be. So what you do is you... you so. Redeed and I said, God, if you want us to go, wake up Carrie Deason and make her get a hold of us. She... Well, a couple of days went by, and the board again met, and again elected me unanimously their pastor. And I was just... Finally, Redeen said, I'm going to call Carrie Deason. I said, don't bother that old woman. He said, I'm calling her, and if you don't... I said, okay, I'll do it. Down. Hello. 
Hello, Carrie, this is Gary Hennigy. Oh, Gary, I haven't, I, this is so unusual. I haven't heard from you in ages. She said, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. She said, well, you've been so on my heart lately. I have. Yeah, I've been praying. She says, God told me you have a call to a church you're supposed to take. That was my first pastorate. Do you know in five years that church went from an average in the 20s to averaging 400 people every Sunday morning in five years? It launched my entire ministry on that little country church. I wouldn't even been there. But I knew an old lady who Jesus wasn't just a story in a book. And as we begin this march toward Easter, I'm going to ask you two questions. Number one, who do you say that I am? I mean, who is he to you? Not to the church of the Nazarene. Actually, brothers and sisters, this shouldn't be on Facebook, but I'm sure it will be. If the church of the Nazarene blew apart and didn't exist next year, you know the kingdom of God will go right on? I know it's shocking, but... Probably not as well, but <laughs> no, no, I'm not talking about the church. Who do you say he is? And then the second question is this: Do you have a Carrie Decent in your life? Are you Carrie Decent for somebody else? Or do you think that's just a weird story that God picks some lonely old woman? By the way, she never knew a day of loneliness. Is it possible that Christ would be more than he's ever been before if we really knew the meaning of the cross and who he is and we did more than come to church but be hungry to discover what Christ could do with us?